Welcome to this video lecture on technology and innovation management. This lecture is part of a three-part set of lectures on ethics, responsibility, and sustainability of digital technologies, which are provided as part of a course in business and management at the University of Hamburg. In this particular lecture, we will cover the third aspect, environmental issues regarding digital technologies. We will start by looking at this idea of environmental issues a little bit more closely. In the following, what I will refer to is environmental issues in the sense of sustainable development. That means production and consumption or the development of production and consumption in a way that meets the needs of the present generation without jeopardizing the ability of future generations to meet their own needs and choose their own lifestyles. So the question of how digital technologies relate to the production and consumption of materials and artifacts and products and services and anything else based on resources in the natural environment um, that we produce in consumer presence and in the future. Now, with this specific definition, we need to go back a little bit, just very briefly where this is coming from. Um, this is coming from a, a study that was conducted in the early 70s, the Club of Rome, which was um, a, an organization instructed by the United Nations at the time to um, investigate scenarios about how the growth of the human population and its resource demands will impact the planet and global society. Um, this report is very famous. It's known as the Limits to Growth. Um, and the key message of this report is continuing the then present model for production consumption. So our economic, global economic model as is, will lead to the eventual destruction of natural resources required for a living planet. In other words, the natural environment of planet Earth and its resources will not suffice or sustain um, the way that we operate the economy, the way that we operate production and consumption. <clears throat> um, and this has been going on to this day, and it has become quite famous, so 50 years forward, um, there is now a way of measuring um, the extent to which we are using and or depleting these natural environmental resources that we are being provided by our planet. Um, in this year, in this year, for example, there is August 2nd is the so-called Earth Overshoot Day. So that is the day in which the human population on planet Earth is overshooting or has exceeded the capacity of the natural resources that would have been sustainable in the definition that I've, in the sense of the definition that I've shown you. Um, of course, this is August second is an average day for the planet. If you look at you know the Earth overshooted by different countries and their resource demands. Um, it looks a little bit different. So you can see here that Germany May fall it comes a lot earlier. And if you want Jamaica, December twentieth is one of the most sustainable uh, human societies on the planet. They almost get by through a year. Um, you can look up this old country overshoot day, um, and the key point is this: this country, this overshoot day has been coming earlier every single year on record, except for the year 2020 when we had the pandemic and for a large part of that year, we were actually limiting our resource demands. We didn't fly anywhere, we didn't go anywhere, we didn't produce anything and so forth. Um, now, this particular as is model of production consumption that the Club of Rome referred to already in 1970, what is that? That is known as basically what is now called the linear economy. Um, where we take natural resources, source them yeah, through mining or other things, produce goods and services, use goods and services, dispose them when we're done with them, and then add them to waste stream, a linear economic model. And this is the model that the Club of Rome referred to, saying that this model is unsustainable. We cannot keep sourcing new resources, producing, using, and disposing them um, because um, our resource sources are finite. Um, <clears throat> which is why now other types of economic models are being considered. And with now, I literally mean over the last couple of years. In our region of the world, for example, there is the Circular Economy Action Plan, which is about three years old by the European uh, Commission. So in the European Union, we are trying to build a different type of economy, which is not linear anymore, but it's now circular. So it looks like a circle instead of a straight line. What's the idea? 
The idea would be to keep a cycle going between production and consumption. So when we produce and use and dispose material, is there a way of reinserting that into the cycle so that any disposed materials can be resourced, recycled to be used again in production and use? Yeah. And this idea of a circular economy builds basically on three main principles. Depending on where you read, you can you can find also nine principles and four principles and seven principles, but you can sort of abstract them to three main principles. Number one is reduce. So reduce the use and sourcing of new virgin materials and reduce the amount of products that we're actually generating. During use, we're trying to get to reuse. So not just one-time use, but reusing, sharing, repairing materials and products so that we can use them longer. And at the end of that cycle, from dispose we and into the source and produce step, we want to recycle and reuse some of the materials for the new sourcing and production. So we want to turn a line into a, a cycle, basically. That's the main idea behind the circular economy that is now being pushed forward, that we're realizing quite drastically that this linear economic model that people already told us in the 70s will not be sustainable, that we try to get to a circular economy because that meets this idea of sustainable development as the idea to meet our present needs and retaining capacity to meet future generations need in a better way. Um, and this has been tried now. I'll give you one example from a technology product, um, which is the Fairphone, which is a smartphone like your Samsung, Apple, Google phones, but it's built on circular economy principles. So for example, it minimizes the use of virgin resources and rare earth material. I'll talk about these later and uses a lot of recycled materials. It is built entirely modular so that it's a lot easier to repair, recycle, and um, you know, redistribute parts, reuse parts, so keep it longer in use. And also it is built to last instead of being built so that it becomes all solid after two years when the warranty expires basically, so that we don't have to buy a new phone every two years, right? So this is called the Fairphone, um, which is a more circular, economy-friendly, smartphone and then your you know the mainstream generation uh, phones that and devices that we have um that is trying to live by the circular economy principles and as this example also shows if you look at you know if you ask around how many people actually have it so i ask this question quite a lot very often i get about 20 percent of people that i ask have heard of the fairphone and about two to three four percent actually use it including myself i also don't use the fairphone even though i know it exists and i know it's a a more sustainable option for a smartphone than the, the normal one. This brings me to what we know about barriers and developments towards a circular economy. So this idea isn't necessarily new. And as I said, there's now a, a legal framework, at least in our region, to push a circular economy. Um, but we're not there, right? And why are we not there? There's a couple of known reasons. Um, one of them is cultural. We didn't know much about the circular economy. Um, there's not a lot of public knowledge, awareness, and acceptance. On the other hand, what we've seen over the past years is that we've had more advocacy and commitment towards sustainable development, the limits of natural resources, the need to you know, change our economy and so forth. I mentioned a few of them here. Fridays for Future, of course, is to mention. Extinction Rebellion, uh, the IPCC, um, yeah, COP28, which you may have seen in the news recently. Um, these are all institutions that build, that that work against the cultural barrier towards the circular economy. There's also been regulatory barriers. So in other words, a lack of policies and frameworks that would support the establishment of a circular economy business, uh, for example. But we have seen uh, new regulation and legislation, especially in all parts of the world. This, this EUC action plan that I've mentioned is one of them. There are also a couple of other very important legislations that have passed, like the WEEE, which is, in, uh, which is a directive that stipulates law for the repair and recycling of uh, household computer, consumer technology, like white goods, like your washing machine, your dishwashers, uh, fridges, these sorts of things, to mandate that they are better to disassemble, better to reuse, better to repair, better to recycle. 
EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility, is a similar legislative directive that stipulates more rights to repair and reuse digital technologies and extends the responsibility of producers to be reviews, pre, uh, responsible for their products and what happens to their products even after they sold it to the customers. So in other words, Microsoft, Apple, Google, they are still responsible for their products even if they've sold them to you. So for example, they must offer free recycling programs. They must take back uh, damaged devices and so forth. And finally, the rights to repair legislation is a legislation that warrants more rights to consumers and third party actors to repair these devices. You may know if you have an Apple phone that for a long time, you had to go to the Genius Bar, you had to go to a licensed Apple partner, otherwise your warranty would be voided or they would sw literally switch off your phone. Um, they are not allowed to do that anymore. You will have the right, if you paid for your device, to repair and sort of modify it as you see fit. Um, there's also market barriers uh, to the circular economy. Um, one of them is that it's very expensive to build a circular, a circular economy business. Um, reused, re Recycled materials are actually more expensive than virgin materials. Um, and what is being done about this is that we have new financing models, uh, subvention models, um, these types of things to make uh, these market barriers uh, less of a barrier. Um, there's institutional reasons, uh, very complex value chain structures, limited willingness or incentives to collaborate for different parties. Um, for this, we do have technologies that can help with this, like uh, data sharing platforms, platform economies, and so forth. And there have been a lot of technological issues or barriers to the circular economy. One of the key issues is that if you want to get a circular economy going, you need to know where your materials and your products are at any given point in time in their life. Not only during design and development, but also after sales, in use, after use, during disposal, during uh, waste collection and so forth. So that was always very difficult to track all these billions of products that float around on the planet. And so we didn't have a lot of information about where they were, who had them, what was the status, what was the quality, what could possibly be reused, um, what needs to be repaired and so forth. But of course, technolo digital technologies help with exactly that challenge. Um, because we now have advances in sensor technology, we have advances in data sharing, we can make things connected to the internet, um, we can make things smart, we can make things uh, trackable, traceable, poolable, and so forth. So that's exactly what I want to look at um, here to see, tell you a little bit about how technologies may actually help. Uh, with the environmental issues and help building a more circular economy. And the idea here is that you say, well, to get a circular economy going, you effectively need to have a lot of information about where things are, how good they are, what you could do with them, who owns them and so forth. I'll just give you one example from which is one product, which is yogurt cups. Yeah, like you see them on the top right here, yogurt cups. Um, that someone needs a plastic manufacturer needs to produce them. We need to produce the product. Uh, you know, of course, we put yogurt in them. Then that goes to a retailer. The retailer, the end consumer buys them, eats the yogurt, drops it into the yellow bin. Uh, the waste collector comes, collects them, puts them into a waste sorting facility, a recycling facility. And ideally, we want that old plastic cup to be reused and resourced to produce new plastic cups, for example. That would be a circular economy. And the key point of this figure here is to, just to show you how complex that already is, how many companies we have, how many technologies are involved. The technologies themselves come from different operate, uh, original equipment manufacturers, OEMs. Um, so just to get that material flow, to get that yogurt cup flowing through the cycle, a lot of these parties need a lot of information from a lot of different other parties. So you see here that the data flow who needs to know what from whom at what point is incredibly more complicated than the actual material flow. And that is very often the barrier, right? So we have technologies not talking to another, the information isn't standardized, the information that one um, party has is not being shared with another party, um, they don't have any incentive for sharing this data, it wouldn't be in the right format, they wouldn't know at what point, who needs to know it anyways. So the question here is, how do we solve this information challenge 
to even be able to identify that there is a plastic cup, it could be reused, it's right here, I can clean it up, I can get it to your manufacturing facility then, and so forth. So I wanna to talk to you about four examples, how technologies can help with these challenges. The first example is about uh, what's called a lemon market, which is the problem that even if you wanted to reuse secondary materials in the production of comments, as opposed to new materials, virgin materials, that comes with uncertainties. So in other words, you don't know where you can get such secondhand plastic material. You don't know who good they are. You don't know who supplies them. You don't know at what time, in what quality, how much of that would be available. So you have quality uncertainty, you have a, a supplier trust risks, you have higher transaction costs, you need to search, you need to get inform additional information. You might have customer acceptance risk, people might not wanna have stuff made from recycled materials. All of that, of course, then you know, culminates in higher costs, higher prices. This is a situation known as a lemon market. Yeah, and it's known, for example, from a shady, Car, uh, car dealers that sell used cars, where we have the situation that we have, if you see a, a used car that is you know, surprisingly cheap, very often it's because you don't know much about the history of the car. And you get into this really weird situation that a poorly informed buyer that doesn't know much about the history of a car he's about to buy, can only buy at a price and only where only the worst sellers would be willing to offer their used cars. Right? That's called a lemon market. And this lemon market situation is the same um, when it comes to secondary materials. We don't know enough about them. We can't trust the quality. Um, we have higher search and transaction cost, And therefore, it's even more expensive to use secondary materials than it would be to get new plastics from virgin materials. How do you solve this problem? One of the things that uh, is being trialed at the moment is a, techno a digital technology called watermark technology. Yeah, so the idea would be that you build platform markets, the technology platforms that are the markets where people can offer and, and buy and request and supply secondary materials. Yeah, so one example is excess material change where you can do supply demand matching. You can think of a Twitter for recycled stuff. Yeah, um, then this digital watermark technologies is being used to identify and certify the product's material composition. So to have information about the source of origin, the composition, the materials, their status, the quality, their age, their location, and all these sorts of things. How does it work? Um, here's an example in the EU, we are pioneering this, not we, but the EU is pioneering that. The idea is that you have a watermark, yeah, like you would have on your, on your bank notes, mm -hmm which is a machine, but not human legible um, QR code, basically all over your product, where a, any technology that is able in barcode scanning can actually extract all the relevant information about that particular product that you're seeing here. Yeah, so a digital watermark technology for packaging. Uh, and then what you could do with this technology, when it comes into the waste stream, so when it ends up as a, as a waste collection or waste sorting facility, we have better information about the product and then thereby can sort and ideally identify and reuse it more efficiently. And um, this, I'll, I just brought some stats to show you how effective that is. So on the left-hand side, you see the typical recycling statistics. Yeah, so plastic packaging, the stuff that you put into your yellow bin makes um, out of out of the, your yellow bin, 68% of that is recycling waste. Uh, it's plastic packaging. Yeah, like plastic bottles, plastic containers, these sorts of things. By the way, almost 20% is waste that shouldn't even be in the yellow bin. Um, and then the, the second set of statistics, sorting accuracy says like, how easy is it for waste sorting technologies to filter these different types of plastic packaging? Yeah, PE, PET bottles, you probably know, these are these sorts of um, reusable uh, water bottles or Coke bottles, these sorts of things, uh, where we have an accuracy of about 80 to 90%. And then it drops quite quite quickly, right? Metal, aluminium, other types of things. We, we can't even sort very good, so meaning that if we can't sort them out, we can't identify, we can't you know recycle them, we can't reuse them. And so they're basically lost. They end up as waste yeah, for incineration, all of which culminates in a plastic packaging recycling rate of 34%. This is the recycling rate of stuff that is actually designated as recycling waste Put already put in the yellow bin. Out of that, only one in three actually ends up being recycled. On the right-hand side, you see the test results 
for Holy Grail. This is this watermark technology where they tried it um, with, uh, as you can see here, four, four different types of plastic packaging um, in mixed packaging waste creeps. Yeah, so so you know, like like a standard yellow bin kind of thing, where they put in a few of these PEPT flexible. PP type of packages contained with watermark technology, and then gave, went to a uh, waste sorting facility and had a look at how how easy, how correctly did it identify those. And you can see here, these numbers are a lot higher. Yeah, so that solves one problem in one step of the entire uh, circular value chain. Um, second example, so this is from, I guess, from uh, disposal back to produce. During production to use, we see a, a second use of digital technologies, namely what's called a digital twin. A digital twin is a virtual counterpart of, a, of any physical or even non-physical entity that captures form function operation of these entities at a very, very granular level of uh, fidelity and timeliness. So in other words, we build a, a virtual count copy, a twin of any product that we're building. Yeah, so we, you see on the right-hand side, you see that for large construction sites, we use that for airplanes, uh, big ships, containers, these sorts of things. So the idea will be that you have a digital twin of a physical product that you're building um, where you have connections between the, the, the digital and the physical twin, which means that they need to be tethered, right? So that means that any physical dimension of the real product need to transmit, sense information and send it somewhere to the digital twin. So the digital twin stays up to date and then we can more readily follow, trace, um, and analyze the digital twin as opposed to the actual physical product, right? So we need some sort of tethering from and to the physical object, which is uh, difficult uh, for some products and more usable for others. Well, we do that at the moment already, are very large scale complex uh, products. Yeah, as I said, ships, airplanes, building these sorts of things. We don't use that for end consumer devices, let's say shoes or uh, fashion. Um, but the idea would be that you can say, look, you can detect issues faster. You can do something like predictive maintenance. You can use algorithms to analyze the composition of any product and then see how likely it is that it will run into an issue soon before it happens. Just to give you one example, Hilti Corporation, they built power tools for building and construction. They use a lot of that for predictive maintenance and they identify the drills um, that something will go off before it does go off. Right? So that allows us to use and repair much more effectively than we've done in the past. Now, here's one example uh, for mask, a cradle to cradle password for vessels yeah, and container ships, these sorts of things. Third example for digital technologies that help not with uh, disposal, recycling and sorting and with uh, production and use and through twinning is the third one is through data sharing, ownership and governance. You remember that I said, one of the challenges in the circular economy is that we need a lot more information flowing to and from all the different parties to make this circular material flow happen. Yeah, so we need a lot of traceability of products, lots of data about lots of products from lots of parties from lots of locations at a lot of different point in time, right? And all the different participants in the circular economy, everyone in that cycle needs a different type of data, different points in time with different types of uh, you know, relevant information in them. And of course, all this data changes throughout the life cycle from production to use to disposal, you know, through recycling and so forth. So the question here is how do we build a, an infrastructure that allows governance of this data, sharing of this data and answers questions of responsibility and ownership of this data. Um, there's a couple of things that are being done. Of course, one of them is to agree on standards, data formats and interfaces. Um, for the different parties that are involved. One slight tiny little thing that is being done, of course, is for example, that all devices now have a normed uh, USB interface, a USB-C interface that, that solves some of the issues. So you do, at least don't need a lot of different plugs and cables. Um, the other option that is being um, tried at the moment is that you build what are called secure and decentral data spaces. Meaning that all the data that you need for the circular economy to handle is not with one organization and one organization doesn't have to open it up to another organization, but rather everyone puts it into a decentralized data space um, where they can secure ownership of their own data, but everyone can request access to part of that data that they need. Yeah, so um, that means that you can solve issues such as trust, non-willingness to share information and so forth. 
And of course, it allows every node in such a data space to update their part of the information as it changes. Yeah, um, there's a few of those. Here's one example, which is called Katina X. And when you look at this, you will see um, this is a decentralized data space of four consortiums, about 28 firms, all of which are in car manufacturing. You see some of the names here, right? So Katina X is a decentralized circular economy data space in the automotive sector. And I just want to highlight one little thing here. You can see here that the Mercedes-Benz is in there, Daimler, Volkswagen is in there, BMW is in there. So basically three of the largest and biggest competitors on at least in Germany of the global market, they're all cooperating in this. So even competitors are joining this consortium where they all agree to share data amongst one another in some sort of decentralized space. But of course, being a consortium, they always have to find some sort of consensus to get things moving forward, which is very timely, uh, you know, time and cost um, intensive. And the final example I wanted to show now that we've had covered uh, from waste, disposal, the sorting to use, we have production, we had uh, you know maintaining a flow of data during production, use and disposal. And the fourth one is about um, use itself. You get people to reuse. And the example I brought here are from two German startup companies, Recap and Vital. Both of them um, tried to get people to reuse something very simple, namely coffee cups, yeah? Um, the background to this is that there is, in fact, a new law effect, uh, in Germany as effective as of 1st of January 23 that um, any restaurant, any takeout business, uh, any takeout food or drink business has to offer or has to use resourceable, reusable um, food containers. Yeah. And you will see probably that many of them now offer these, but it's by no means actually that, you know, you use them all the time. Vital and Recap are two providers in this space. Um, they all use reusable uh, coffee cups, reusable pizza containers, stuff like that. Now, I want to look at this a little bit. If you take a single-use packaging container, like your standard coffee cup, it's very simple. The environmental impact of that is the more of them you have, the higher the impact. It's very linear, of course, right? And, of course, it depends on what this container is being made of. Yeah, If it's an alum aluminum package, it's a little bit higher than, for example, the gas you probably don't know what bagasse is, but bagasse is basically a shredded sugar cane. Uh, and, you know, you can also use that if you compress that, it also makes uh, for single use um, uh, food containers. Yeah, uh, like bamboo is another option. And these are a little bit more environmentally friendly. So the ecological footprint, footprint is less steep. But of course, the more of them you use, the higher the footprint. Very simple. Now, the interesting bit about if you think about reusable packaging, if you look at it individually, they're worse than single-use containers. Very simply. Yeah, first of all, um, if you think about a plastic container that you can reuse, it actually has a higher footprint because it needs to be thicker, it needs to be more durable, it needs to be uh, able to withstand, you know, heavy use, cleaning, dishwasher, you know, temperatures, all these sorts of things. Moreover, if you're reusing the same thing, you need to clean it and you need to transport it from like the last time use to the next time use. So the impact from initial production is higher. And the impact the environmental from sanitization and transport is higher. So by and large, one single reusable container is worse than you just using a single cup container, okay? Now, the question then is, at what point does it make sense to use reusable packaging instead of single-use packaging? And you can sort of, you can mathematically determine that, but by and large, you could say the break-even point is a 10-time reusing. Right. So if you use a reusable packaging container, you see that the environment footprint starts at a higher, the ecological is at a higher level, but the, the curve is a little bit flatter because of course we're not adding you know a single use container every single time. At some stage, this curve will cross the one from a standard single use container and from there it will be flatter. And this point is 10 times. So the next time you get a recap cup, you have to think like, I have to use it 10 times to make it ecologically a positive impact. Otherwise I could have used, you know, nine single, single takeout coffee cups. Um, and of course this depends a little bit on what these different uh, containers are made of, right? So if it's aluminum, PP plastic or a PET plastic, for example, right? So PET, as you can see, is actually higher. You need more to clean it and you need more to produce it, right? So this number of 10 varies a little bit more, but by and large, it's about 10 times. Now, the problem is 
that how do you guarantee 10 cycles of reuse cycle? Yeah. For that, that is a question of how often do you return it? Yeah. So how frequently, if you take out a reusable cup container, how often do you bring it back? So it can be reused. If you don't return it, then, you know, you can't reuse it. For example, we have recup cups at home and they've been literally sitting on, on our shelf for what five months. We forget to bring them back. Yeah. Simple. Yeah, and this is a, a huge problem of fair cup of recup of some of the other ones that their return rate is basically you know first of all most of that is unknown we don't know but it, it's it's something between thirty and seventy percent yeah and if you have a, a, a rate between 30 70 80 even 90 percent uh, under 90 percent you cannot get to 10 users per cup because of course at some stage they break down eventually anyway. So basically you need to guarantee a return rate of at least 90%. Otherwise you will never get to the 10 times reuse that would actually even justify having a reusable package container in the first place. Yeah, so we need a return rate of more than 90%. Most of the time we receive something like 50 to 70, sometimes 80%, which effectively means we're reusing anything most of five times. Give you one example. Beer bottles, uh, you know, your Coke bottles, anything you actually bring back to, to the bottle recycling. Um, you know, usually we have a, a deposit based system, like a fund basierte system. You get something, a return rate of 50 to 75%, which means that every average beer bottle you held in your hand has been reused three times, but not 10 times. So that's an issue. Another issue is that the exact numbers cannot be determined. A third issue is that we don't even incentivize people to do the right things, right? So for example, disposable uh, bottles that are actually uh, costlier than reusable bottles, 25% uh, versus 8% deposit, are still used more frequently because if you wanted to price the deposit at a level that it actually incentivizes people to return them, you would have to force people to give, you know, 50 bucks of deposit or something that would, no one would do. Also, if you see like how does uh, you know the business model of a company like Recap operate? Well, they charge any company that participates thirty euro flat fee, and then they can get a bunch of flat uh, uh, Recap containers. You pay your one euro deposit. That's it. There's no penalty or incentive, monetary wise, to actually return the cup. Otherwise, than other than you losing one euro, and the company that's participating, the the restaurant, isn't 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 incentivized in any way. Now, Vital is different because it achieves a reuse rate of 99.3%. So literally almost every container is being reused. How do they do that? So Vital is a little bit different from Recap in that it has a reusable plastic container that comes with a QR code that you can scan with your Vital app and that can scan by a restaurant with their Vital app as well. Yeah. So you basically check in and check out the containers through an app as you, you know, get them or return them at some stage. And this data then feeds in vital into a, a, an analytics dashboard that, for example, shows where this is the city of Cologne, where um, different types of plastics, uh, where different containers are at any given point in time, right? So the different colors you see here are pizza containers, uh, food bowls, coffee cups, these sorts of things. So can, they basically track where their products, where their reusable containers are, uh, where they're being supplied, where they're being demanded, and so forth. And what they do now is that they use different incentive schemes to um, get people to return them. They use a technology that's called nudging. Nudging is the idea, as you can see here, if you're, if you're male and you've ever been in a public toilet, you see sometimes you have these pissoirs that have a fly. The idea here is that you please aim for the fly so you don't have a lot of splashback. You don't have to shoot at the fly, of course. You can aim somewhere else, but most people do. Yeah, This is called a nudge. Yeah, it's based on the Nobel Prize winning work by, uh, by Richard Taylor. And the idea of nudging is that you give people every choice. They are free to do anything they want to do, but you still nudge them. Yeah, you kind of tickle them to do the one option that you want them to do. Yeah, so a nudge is an aspect of a decision architecture that changes people's behavior in a predictable way but without prohibiting options or significant outside the economic incentives. So we're not making things more expensive or cheaper. We're not using law. We're not mandating or penalizing anything, right? So we're not making you compliant by taking options away or making options unfeasible to you. We're just nudging you that out of a set of alternative options, you want to do the things that we want you to do. Yeah, that's called a nudge. 
And that's a very effective way. Um, and there's a lot of evidence to show how effective that is. Uh, here's one example, a nudge called that's the opt-in versus opt-out principle. What you see here is a chart of organ donors, uh, the on consent right to donate your organ if something happens to you, to people that need a new kidney or a new liver or whatever else. On the right hand side, you see a consent rate that is basically 100%. On the left hand side, you see countries where the consent, the organ donor consent rate is something between, you know, four and 20%, so a lot lower. What's the difference? The difference is how people are being nudged to become an organ donor. In countries like Germany, Denmark, and the UK, you are not an organ donor unless you actively opt into this. Like you have to sign up to become an organ donor, you have to do this willingly. On the right hand side, Austria, France, Hungary, you are an organ donor automatically unless you opt out. So you have to take a step to opt out of that system. Yeah, and people are lazy. So opting out, it makes people more to stay opted in. And if you force people to opt in, then more people will stay to opt it out. And this is a nudge because everyone is free to either be an organ donor or not. The only thing that's different is what is the default? The default is you are an organ donor unless you choose not to. Or the default is you're not an organ donor unless you choose to be one. And you see how different um, the, the outcome is here. Yeah. And now that just can be done like the organ donor example. They don't have to do anything with technology, um, but they can be, right? Digital nudges are very easy to implement and you all know several of them already. If you ever shopped on Amazon, you see many, many nudges. Here, for example, on the right hand side, you see that the nudge is this little orange thing that says bestseller. What do you think most people out of four options to buy a backpack, most people buy the bestseller? Whether or not it is the best seller is completely relevant, but by labeling is this, you're nudging people to buy that. Yeah, because we tend to believe that then that's the best thing. On the left hand side, you see what you all would have come to experience, which are cookie um, things. We are being nudged to actually provide cookies to the implementers. We do have all the options. We can customize, we can configure, we can reject everything we want, but it's actually made difficult to us. And it's a lot easier to just click the green button and be done with it. In the middle, you see push notifications. Again, you, you have all the options. You can uh, you know, disregard, you can set them off. But by default, you get you know, what the people want you to do, which is in this case, buy certain things at 50% off. Yeah? And this idea of nudging is what, what Vital uses. Yeah? So it doesn't use monetary incentives. Instead, it uses nudges, digital nudges, to return and use bots. So in other words, you don't have to pay a de deposit like you have to do with Recap. You have 40 days to use and return the container for free. And what it does, it uses the app to send you push notifications ahead of time or in location and so forth. So it knows, of course, with the tracking ability that you have the cup and says like, hey, I see that you're in Grindelalli. Uh, did you know that you can return your pizza container that you checked out last week um, next door at the kebab store? for example. It sends reminders and makes sure that, by the way, if you don't return it by tomorrow, you will have to stop paying for it. Yeah. So it also offers promotions like, hey, if you get this and this done now, the next ball will be, you know, even longer or whatever else. So all of these are nudges that it uses to make people make sure that these balls that they have are as much as as often as frequent as, you know, as possible in the system and are being reused and, and utterly uh, effective this way, yeah? Now, having talked about four examples for how technologies can help with environmental issues, in this last part, I now wanna talk about the dark side. Yeah, so environmental issues that stem from digital technologies. So, so far I talked a little bit about the solution potential, but of course, digital technologies themselves are also part of the environmental issues that we face, yeah? For a, a number of reasons, and I brought three of those. One of the first ones is that all technologies that we have contribute to a huge uh, waste and disposal problem that is actually bigger than all the other waste and disposal problems. It's known as the problem of e-waste. Yeah, e-waste is electronic waste. So all these old computers, old phones, old tablets, old devices, old monitors, old mouses and keyboards and everything like this. This has become a huge global issues um, also because what happened is that parts like the Western countries, the EU and the United States, they literally dumped a lot of that issues in other countries. So we basically sold them to other countries um, who would then have to deal with this enormous waste problem. Yeah. Here's one chart from 2016. 
And that shows you how much e-waste is being generated. Now on the left-hand side, you see that Germany, for example, is number five in total e-waste generations. And you might think, well, you know, it's not as bad as China or US. Sure, but if you look at the right-hand side, which is the e-waste by, by capital, so, you know, by number of people, it is actually the worst in the world. Yeah, Germany produces on average but per person the most electronic waste on this planet. Yeah, so it is an issue that we ourselves create. And I've just brought one example of what happens to this electronic waste. It has to happen somewhere. And there was a very famous um, um, newspaper investigation about 10 years ago um, about Guiyu, which is a city in China, which was at that stage the largest e-waste recycling center in the world. And it looked like the images on the right hand side. That's what that looked like. It recycled about 15,000 tons of e-waste every day and about 70% at that time of the world's e-waste that was being produced. Meaning that about 5,500 family run workshops, about 100,000 people were employed to dealing with e-waste. Yeah, 80% of the population made their living from the disassembly, dismantling and disposal of electronic waste. Now electronic waste has lots of uh, components in it. Yeah, there's graphite, there's gold, um, but there's also lead, zinc, uh, and all sorts of very harmful and toxic substances. Yeah. So, and what happened is that in this region, the inhabitants of that region had the highest reported lead and dioxin levels ever found in humans worldwide, at a high, very high miscarriage rate about pregnant women, um, and seventy percent of the children born in this area had a high concentration of lead. This only became known about ten years ago. Um, because at that time, you know, literally the waste that we produced didn't end up on our shores. It ended up in China, and a lot of that is also ap happening in Sub-Saharan Africa. That's a huge issue. And I also wanted to say that ever since this became publicly known, um, China itself, the government actually, you know, changed the Guiyu region in the sense that it professionalized and industrialized this e-waste uh, facility. So it now has an industrial park less than these family run workshops on the on the street, as you can see here. But of course, the contamination issues and long term consequences are still there. So electronic waste is a huge issue. The second issue that people often forget is that the ICT industry, so the industry that produces and develops new technologies and sells them, is an enormous industry sector. Um, and it creates about 1.5 to 4%, depending on which study you look at, of greenhouse gas emissions of the industry. And just to put that into perspective, uh, in Europe, in Germany, for example, when we talk about environmental impact, we talk a lot about you know flying less and using the train a lot more. Well, the emissions of ICT are a lot more than the global aviation industry, yeah? And we never talk about this. So we, we should actually talk about, you know, people having less computers and using their phone less rather than flying less, yeah? Uh, of course, it's not only about greenhouse gas emission. You can also talk about electricity generation. Um, for example, this industry alone has basically the electric, electric generation of Jap Japan and Germany, two of the top four uh, biggest economies in the world, or top five. Uh, approaches 10% of world electricity generation. Um, and just to give you one example, one data center, for example, for your Dropbox account or for your Facebook, et cetera, is basically, and uh, it has an electricity band basically of a town like the size of Stuttgart yeah, or Münster. Um, and of course, um, you, all these technologies have lots of effects and they have direct and indirect effects. Yeah, the direct effects, the actual direct footprint of technology is doing production. So when we build hardware, when we operate hardware, that's usually electricity components and disposal, right? The resource and energy for disassembling, dismantling and disposing ICT hardware. Yeah, um, but these are just the direct effects. There's also indirect effects that appear here, right? So there are substitution optimization effects. And I'll just give you one example that is very famous, which are the so-called rebound effects. Now, what happens is that as ICT makes a lot of things cheaper, faster, more convenient, more accessible to people, what we have to see is a disproportionately stronger use of these services. Yeah? So for example, now that we have mobile phones with better 5G connectivity at a cheaper price, we use it disproportionately more for streaming videos. So we watch more videos because it is relatively speaking cheaper and, and faster to download one. Yeah, that's called the rebound effect or a Jevons paradox. And it's it's known for a long time. You have the same in cars. So for example, if you have a more fuel efficient cars, you end up driving more than you would have done with a fuel inefficient car. Yeah. 
That's called a rebound effect. And we have that in ICT use quite a lot. Yeah. Uh, so for example, one other aspect is if, if ICT use is a little more cheaper for us, we have more money left and that we can use for flying to some place uh, for, for holidays. Yeah. So I'll get, just give you one example of a, a technology that is very popular at the moment, generative AI, like ChatGPT. And if you just think about the electricity, greenhouse gas and energy footprint of that technology, these are enormous. Yeah. So training a single AI model. So training a model like ChatGPT on a large language models, um, that's basically, uh, it's roughly equivalent in CO2 emissions that we need for the training, for the computing power required to develop this model is as much as five cars over their entire lifetime. Yeah. So if you just take one large uh, uh, machine learning model, like one, one of them that does one thing in one context by one provider, um, that's basically as much as you drive your car for about 240,000 miles. That's the carbon footprint. Yeah. Uh, the electricity command in co uh, consumption of ChatGPT3, for example, is just of that one technology is equivalent to the emissions of 112 petrol powered cars. And of course, uh, these requirements keep on growing, like ChatGPT4 is even worse, ChatGPT4.5 is even worse, and so forth. The resource requirements, the computing requirements for AI, it's to scale that, just not one model, but many models for many companies, for many users, and so forth, is severely outpacing that of system hardware that we have available. So the computing power, that how that is growing, is nothing in comparison to the computing demands that we're having in this age of AI. So in other words, the footprint that we're seeing here is going to get worse. Yeah, And if you want, you can, uh, here's a link where someone has, uh, you know, provided a tool where you can check your own uh, environmental footprint when you start playing around with ChatGPT and other types of um, uh, AI technologies. And third and final issue that I want to mention here is uh, material demands. And I mentioned this in the very er uh, early part of this lecture, um, the so-called rare earth materials. Now, technologies are complex products and they have very complex materials in them. Yeah, uh, cobalt, lithium, tantalum, indium, gallium, niobium, selenium, zirconium, and so forth. The most well-known of them is the lithium that you know from your batteries in your cars, in your smartphones, in your smartwatches, in, in wearable devices, and so forth. The question is, of course, well, who has, where do all these rare earth materials are being sourced from, who owns them, and you know who controls that supply chain? And what you can see here is that China uh, produces most of these rare earth materials. Um, for example, one of, one of the biggest lithium uh, mines is in Bolivia. Uh, Russia has quite a say in this. Um, so what we see at the moment is a big geopolitical battle about who controls uh, the rare earth materials that we need for the future of high-tech products. And, uh, you know, suffice to say that there is a lot of, let's say, geopolitical tension here. As you can see a little bit from this picture, here, which is fairly old by now, these are not all, let's say, friendly states uh, to, to all other countries, right? So you see that there is a lot of political friction in this particular supply chain involved. Now, this brings us to the end. So sustainable production consumption, environmentally friendly economic models will be difficult to achieve without digital technology. Sure, right? So the idea of environmental sustainability cannot live without digitalization, right? So for example, we need the ability to be able to trace, to address, to intervene, to nudge people and so forth. Digital technologies offer these possibilities so, and we will need them. Oh, but of course, it's a very double-edged sword. Technology itself, CO2 emissions, electricity, raw materials required in waste productions are enormous already, and they grow exponentially at this point. So the impact of technologies per se, direct and indirect, will only continue to grow. Yeah, the, That's an issue also because at the moment, we don't see both of these sides being discussed quite a lot. Like take this course, we spend seven lectures on all the possibilities with digital technologies. And now we spend an hour or so on some of the, the negative side effects of this, right? So this trade-off, to what extent can we get the best out of digital technologies for the environment whilst minimizing its negative output, that will be a key challenge for the future. And that brings us to the end of this lecture. Thank you for listening and thank you for watching.